we're going to move towards the the uh, the end of this service, but uh, something happened at the introduction of, of A Rod that I think it brought some confusion into the room. People have been coming up to me ever since saying, "Are you retiring?" And uh, no, I'm not retiring. I still have a job in Chi Alpha. It's not time to shoot Old Yeller yet. <laughs> I've been carrying multiple hats. I have been serving as the program director and training director, and so I'm just giving up one of my hats, but I'll continue to serve uh, as the program director. Our discipleship definition today is really more a selection from a passage, a very familiar passage from Robert Coleman. That is why it's so important to observe the way Jesus maneuvered to achieve his objective. The master disclosed God's strategy of world conquest. He had confidence in the future precisely because he lived according to that plan in the present. There was nothing haphazard about his life, no wasted energy, not an idle word. He was on business for God. He lived, he died, he rose again according to schedule. Like a general plotting his course of battle, the Son of God calculated to win. He could not afford to take a chance. Weighing every alternative and variable factor in human experience, he conceived a plan that would not fail. I recall reading these words from Coleman's book, The Master Plan of Evangelism, back in my college days in the early 70s. I remember being convinced that Coleman got it right, but I couldn't figure out how you make it work today. Jesus called fishermen to walk with him 24-7, 365 for three years. Just how do you go about replicating that? Then I heard about Brady Bobbink. As a college student, he came to Christ through the witness of a roommate and then started a campus ministry as a student leader. I first met him in 1977 when we worked together on the National Chi Alpha Philosophy Ministry as members of the San Antonio Seven. As I, as I heard him unpack what he was doing in discipleship, I realized Brady did it. He really did. Did it. He's doing master plan on campus and it's working. Over the next several years, I listened to Brady time after time describe his discipleship strategy at Western Washington University. It was like hearing an alien language. On the one hand, he was making perfect sense, but on the other hand, it was a completely foreign paradigm. It took me six years to catch up with what Brady uh, had put in place where I was able to live that same master's method of discipleship for myself at the University of Nebraska. Now let me say unmistakably, I do not believe in reincarnation. But if I did, I would be tempted to come back as Brady Balmick. I envy the well-considered life he has lived. He has been ministering to the same university community for 46 years. As a result, his godly reputation reaches far and wide. He's probably seen over 15,000 students go through his Chi Alpha group, and probably the whole lot of them learned Christ in a discipleship small group. Brady started teaching at RUI, ICM, back in the day in 1978. And over the course of the next four to five years, he laid the theological and practical foundation for the practice of discipleship in Chi Alpha that still exists to this day. He has earned the title, the father of Chi Alpha Discipleship. He trained Chi Alpha's first intern, or CMIT, in 1977. In fact, this intern served for over three decades in Chi Alpha before retiring a few years ago. I have no idea how many hundreds of interns he has since trained. And then he started the first Sikkim decades ago and still hosts two weeks of Sikkim at Western every summer. He's raised up scores of missionary associates that served alongside him at Western. 
He has recruited, equipped, and commissioned Chi Alpha missionaries who have served and presently serve from coast to coast. And he sent missionaries all around the world, not to mention the multiple thousands he has sent out as marketplace Christians. Brady is one of the most brilliant thinkers and practitioners we have ever known in Chi Alpha. His mark on Chi Alpha is unmistakable. The kingdom of God markedly expanded on his watch. He is a living hero in our midst. So join me as we welcome Brady Bobbick to address us this afternoon. I'm going to shake your hand. I love you. Yeah, do thing. Is it possible to take the spots down a little bit so I can actually see humans? <sighs> That'd be a little more, a little more. No, I'm, no, no, no. <laughs> <sighs> um. Lou Gehrig stood in Yankee Stadium, having contacted ALS, and said to the crowd, I am the luckiest man in the world. And I would stand before you and say, in my world, I'm the luckiest man in the world. Today's kind of a, for me, a pinch, a pinch yourself to see if this is really real day. There's a backstory to this day, as you've already heard a bit. It's a backstory about the impact and the implications of consistent discipleship. If I were to ask you, which I am, how many of you have met personally, read, or heard the teachings of Glenn Suggs? How many of you would raise your hands? Two in this mighty throng. Two. Glenn became my roommate when I was a 19-year-old, left-leaning, anti-war, protesting, free love affirming, age of Aquarian embracing, long haired hippie who smoked dope a little bit when it was illegal and a statement of against the man. In my state now, it's controlled by the man to make money for the man. <laughs> we've come a long way, baby, to get where we've got today. I was mentored by those great prophets of my era through the power of music, Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, and Art Garfunkel. Jason, a word of encouragement for you. You look young to me. And a word of wisdom for all of you, never follow children speaking. But let's hear her go. I met Glenn the very first day at Western in a brief encounter that through an improbable set of circumstances, Glenn became my roommate. He chose to enter our house. This was 1970. Glenn was the first openly communicative, serious, heartfelt, eager, joyful, spirit-filled, tongue-speaking Christian I had met. In a word, peculiar. 
This was before I heard that Jesus' people are a peculiar people in the world. Glenn entered our house of party on, and if they made a movie about us, it would be house of party on meets house of prayer. Monday night prayer meetings with Glenn, Friday night parties with me. The commingling of kingdoms. The kingdom of God breaking in and pitching its tent in the middle of the kingdom of Adam. In his provocative book, thank you, Dave Gable. Are you here, David? Where are you? Okay, I just want to know where you're at, brother. Uh, In his provocative book, Dedication and Leadership, which is now outdated because of the fall of the communist empire, but nevertheless absolutely still provocative and true. Hyde says this. He notes that the first meaningful encounters we have with an individual or a part of a community and its mission imprint on us the ongoing definition of how we define that thing. Glenn Suggs imprinted on me the reality of the kingdom of God before any of us were talking that way. Through Glenn's day-to-day life, I experienced a close and personal, through relationship, through endless conversations, through endless questions, through endless, endless kinds of cynicism, Cynicism toward him, the thoughtful, gracious, risk boldness, and persistent tenacity of a person seeking to walk consistently in the fruit and the power of the Spirit. Glenn's Jesus loving and serving DNA became an initial framing image of what I would understand it meant to be a Jesus person in the secular campus. The impact, as I look back over my life, of Glenn moving in with us has become part of the DNA of our community. We have a lot of residence halls, and there was a young man by the name of Paul Wendler who lived in one through five years of undergraduate studies. He lived there intentionally because he heard how Glenn had intentionally lived at 1512 High Street. Eventually, Paul graduated, and the burden he had on his heart was who would reach his dormitory for Jesus. There was a young man in this small group that was emerging into a greater heart of mission, and one day this man came, this young man came to him, and he says, Paul, you wouldn't believe it. You know, you know I wanted to live on campus, and you know I couldn't, and I looked, came into my room, and there in an envelope was a thousand dollars with a message scratched out. You are my missionary in this dorm, unsigned. Today at Western, we have the Paul Wendler Memorial Scholarship. He's not dead. We're just memorializing his vision and tenacity, which I first saw in Glenn Suggs. Today, Paul Wendler oversees in an unreached people group a pair area of ministry that seeks to reach university students for Christ. What's the impact of a consistent disciple who is out to make disciples? You and I are. Every one of us in this room who calls Jesus Lord, who has become our Savior, all of us are the outworking reality of a disciple-making disciple. 
For all of us, it all started in Galilee with Jesus of Nazareth inviting fishermen from Capernaum with the words, come and follow me and I will turn you into fishers for the hearts and the minds of men and women. If you follow that calling down through perhaps John and into uh, 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 Polycarp of Smyrna and into Athanasia and all the way through of history, at some point, our trees will split and there'll be Glen Suggs, the last link before I'm linked into this endless, amazing chain of grace. The close names will be different, but the genesis of it all is Jesus of Nazareth. What is the impact of this kind of intentional, consistent discipleship? It's the ultimate, in my mind, and eternal pain it forward. You and I now strive compelled by the love of Jesus to extend the chain of transforming grace to those generations around us and not yet to come. What is the impact? The impact is that in Chi Alpha today, we still hold onto this fundamental confident conviction that the power of the triune God can raise up college change agents for his kingdom work in the world from completely unexpected places like progressive, liberal, whacked out West Coast, Western Washington University. And that he can do this through the obedient love of the most normal and mortal souls like Glenn Suggs. If you have received any encouragement from anything in my life at any time, you should give thanks to God for birthing Glenn Suggs. It was October 17th, 1970, five months into my life with Glenn, that I went to a meeting. He would ask me to meetings every week, Jesus people meetings. This was my pre-Chi Alpha days. He would ask me to Jesus people meetings at the communes. He would ask me to church every week with him. And I would say no and no and no again, but we grew close together. He began to know me. He understood my tenacity and stubbornness. And one day he said, Brady, do you want to come? And I said, no. Glenn, don't ask me anymore. I don't want to come. All I've ever seen at church are hypocrites. Glenn put his arm around me gently and kind of said into my ear softly, you should come. Then we could be all together. I don't recommend you try this at home, and especially if you don't know somebody. That word, that suggestion that this hippie, this this new age or hippie anti-war got it all right against the man, human being, could be fundamentally broken and a hypocrite, started a slow movement that led to my saying yes to Jesus. Before I knew there was such a thing as a word of wisdom or prophecy, he spoke a prophetic word. Come be with us, we can all be together. The first thing that became obvious to me as a believer was that I would need to reframe my life refocus it, rename it in every way. It was a new kingdom. And so behind you is my um, Picasso attempt. You can do this on a napkin, but you need to do your own, even though it might look alike since we're all following the same king. 
I was moved by these four words of God. The great commandment to love God and bring Him glory, which called me into a Christocentric life because the great passion of Jesus was first and foremost that His Abba would be glorified. The second word, that we should love our neighbors as we would love ourselves, or as it's put in another place by Jesus, that we should do to others as we would have them do to us. My Christocentric life couldn't be an egocentric life, nor could it be a self-contained life. It was to be a golden rule life. Jesus says to followers of his, I have for you a new commandment. Love one another as I have and continue to love you. And so I discovered I was called into the society of Jesus, a new people group in the world, and that I was to love my brothers and sisters with Christ mediating between us and that I should love them as he was loving me. And then came that great grand commission. Wherever you find yourself going, make disciples of all peace, of all people. This word resonated in my educational orientation as an undergrad, but more than that, it inflamed my heart. It told me that I was a person called to purpose greater than any other purpose, and that was indeed to be a perpetual messenger of the kingdom of God. Me, a little weird kid out of Blaine, Washington. Can anything good come out of Blaine, Washington? You got to go there to know how true that would be. In 1972, Glenn and others, myself amongst them, founded Campus Christian Fellowship, which is now the Chi Alpha affiliate at Western Washington University. That was spring, the beginning of spring. At the end of spring, everybody older left except myself, Scott Sessions, and Julie Sessions. We were all a sum total, the three of us together, five years old in Jesus. We hadn't even had the sense to ask, what do you do next fall? We just knew prophetically we were supposed to start something on campus for spring. Yo, know, what do you do when you're a part of a, of a, of a, a movement, a, a Jesus people revival, and you're swept up into it, and the Lord leads you to do this thing? Well, we learned one thing. It's one thing to be caught in the revival. It's another thing to help sustain its blessings. We had to move from non-sustainable to a sustainable reality, to a reproducing, training, and sending community. And so we began the work. Now, the thing about being in a revival is all you have to do is like a parade. Get in front of it and look like you know what you're doing. (laughs) I found out it was easier to get in front of it than to know what I was doing. In fact, we did not know what we were doing. But the Lord knows. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our ignorance. And he is greater than all of those. In 1974, I left the calling to be a high school teacher in English history and theater, which gave me endless opportunities as a student teacher to share about Jesus. 
and I became the first director of CCF. It was a time to frame our community's life, to give it definition. Because out of definition comes a sense of identity, and out of identity comes a sense of your direction. The text that God led us to was Acts 2, 42 through 47. And so we begin to play around with the text and its implications. By the way, I hadn't read the book of Isaiah, so I didn't know you were allowed to ask God when he says, go, to say, how long? I notice there's a guy out there pointing at us that says, will you go for 40? I asked Shirley. She burst out laughing. That would make me 107 years old when I'm done. I did recruit two people, two of my past interns, one that promised to wheel me in and the other to take care of anything that came out. (laughs) If I was to share with you what I think, and there's more than one, but one thing that is so important for longevity, it is deep gratitude. It is that sense of God's awesomeness that he would choose us, that he would use us, not not in some goofy, negative way, but that he would adopt us and then allow us to participate as the heirs of Jesus Christ. I don't know anything that will kill your longevity more than to lose your sense of awe at God's grace. So today isn't just a pinch me day. Today's also kind of a bookend day. I love books. I got lots of bookends, so here we go. The first bookend related to Chi Alpha was in 1975. I had just met Dave Gable shortly before then. And he and Millie would become lifelong and dearly loved friends. David invited me to a gathering of Chi Alpha missionaries in Springfield. I had never been to Mecca before. (laughs) And being a hippie anti-war protester, it was rather conservative. But the theme they were discussing was not. It was radical. It was a question of what does it mean to make disciples in the university secular context? And he just asked me to come and share what God was leading us to at Western. There were a couple dozen of us sitting on a stage with a curtain drawn so we felt we were not just hanging out there alone. Now, 43 years later, I have the distinct privilege to address the exact same theme that ignited my mind and heart so long ago with all of you. Wherever you find yourself going, make disciples. Back then, we were a few. Now we don't feel so lonely, do we? What's the impact of consistent disciples who make disciples? Again, my being here is the outworking of God's grace through his human instruments oftentimes. When grace-laced, consistent disciple-makers come into your life and and they open up and welcome and empower opportunities, that they're they're a, a doorway and not a wall in your life. Dave opened a door of welcoming trust toward me. And in that singular, 
seemingly small action, so don't belittle your small opportunities to sow a moment of grace or open a door. In that seemingly small action, It put me on a road that could only be described as Robert Frost does in my favorite poem. Two roads diverged in a wooden eye. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. How could a person's life be so blessed because of one older brother opening a door and welcoming and empowering a younger brother. When I think of the blessings that have come from being a part of Chi Alpha, there it's not even good to start naming names, is it? They're all over the place. My good hobbit brother, Sam Genji, Sam Wise, Harvey Herman, We don't smoke, we only drink root beer, but we do have hairy feet. But more than that, we have a love to go to Mordor and destroy the powers of evil. But compared to Harvey, there's somebody else that would have only come into my life through this unusual road of grace. She is my life partner. She has encouraged me. She has corrected me. Even again today, she says, is your zipper up? (laughs) Every man needs a Shirley. She helps me not to say stupid things except that one. that I should be so blessed, so fortunate, so much undeserved grace. My next road stop was a place called San Antonio. You already heard the rumors about the San Antonio 7. It was a group of six of us plus Dave, who Dave gathered together after his assault in Texas at a camp in San Antonio in the summer of 77. And there we became, the San Antonio 7. I hear there's a movie being made about spiritual cowboys coming to a theater near you. Dave set the text of Acts 2, 42 through 47 in front of us and sent us to work. You know that meeting we had yesterday with the attorneys thing and they were telling you about how these two documents came about and they told you how they they wrestled with each word to make sure that it would be heard in a certain way that some judge someplace wouldn't find the wrong application of what we're trying to say. Remember that? That's what San Antonio 7 was like. It was the most intense, invigorating, demanding pursuit of trying to hear God's voice through a text. We debated, we laughed, we prayed, we sang. Little did we know that it would have lasting, shaping influence. But I think Dave knew I think Dave knew that Chi Alpha needed to have a defining, framing word that would articulate a clear and broad vision that we could grow into and never grow out of. Our identity, our missional purpose, and how we intended to become that without, without abandoning our core commitments. In the statement from San Antonio, 
I believe we heard a specific word of God for Chi Alpha. It's a word of God for everybody, amen? But I think specifically, it was a word for us. It reasserted the central importance and underlying purpose of the Great Commission as a universal and fundamental call for believers. It spelled out what we would be devoted to. That word that comes from the Old Testament sacrificial system, to be devoted, to be thrown over completely. Or the way sometimes my staff or my students will put it, I'm all in. I encourage you, don't be afraid to be all in. The psalmist says, laid in his life, that he had never seen a day where the righteous went without. That was his experience of the faithfulness of God. And for those of you who worry a lot about money and all that kind of stuff, I get it. I've done it. But you notice most of it has to work out. I think we're okay. He'll provide. We believe and still believe that intentional, purposeful, relationally driven disciple making is not optional. It is the essential means to Jesus' ultimate ends, to glorify his Abba, to rescue and to restore the lost and to build his witness communities in all of the earth. San Antonio became a template for us. And for those of us who were there at the beginning, we saw how it saved us from both natural distortions and drift that comes over time. It saved us from the temptations of embracing the latest, coolest, newest, fattest sounding emphasis and approach. It rooted us forever and firmly in the work of the Holy Spirit, that when the Spirit comes in power, he builds relationally dynamic communities. It goes in the face of all of our secular individualism, all of our demand to be a different penguin in a penguin world. And yet it allows the Holy Spirit to create and move in us individually and creatively to these ends, not our own ends, these ends. You know, it was a challenge to get buy-in, even though it was the Bible that confused me as a younger believer. Maybe it's because we're Assemblies of God people where we are both blessed by our autonomy and cursed by it. Maybe it's just the way of men and women. But I sense that way over the years is breaking down. And I've heard some of your testimonies that it has broken down in you. We need to remember the main thing was the establishment of visible disciple-making communities in the midst of the secular world. What? Primary training centers is what? There is no place where the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Adam and its abandonment of God is more ferociously pressed than in the training centers called a secular university. Now, if we believe that, we can hold on to Jesus' words that I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I went to a little AG church where every time they sang, hold the fort for I am coming, these little old ladies would wave their white flags. I thought, oh, we're retreating. Thank the Lord for his statement in Matthew, the gates of hell will not prevail 
They will be penetrated and invaded with mere mortals like us. As Donnie Moore would pray, help! We will need it, every bit of it. While we've been here, you've heard and seen the impact of consistent discipleship talked about from our speakers, heard about in your seminars, etc. Kingdom wins over the decades. I would want to put us in memory that to God be the glory. And if we boast... Let us boast in the Lord. For what is a human being and their works other than the gracious intents of God in our lives? You heard that there should not, and we claim there are not shadows. Now, I beg to differ because I grew up with really tall people like Dave Giles and Dave Gable and Kim Sherwood, I learned to look up to my brothers. But I will tell you this, the way that I found my jealousies and insecurities and weirdnesses conquered was to recognize and stay close enough to the greatest shadow one could ever be in, the shadow of the Almighty. And when you're there, it doesn't matter who's big and small because you realize God takes all things together. And so little did Glenn Suggs ever imagine that he would not build a cathedral, but he would light a candle. And the light of that candle with many other candles would touch the world. Do not despise the place of small things. And do not be discouraged if you feel like all we ever talk about is big things. I am here to tell you there is no single man or woman who makes a big thing. It takes a Glenn. It takes a Dave. It takes a Harvey. It takes a Dennis. It takes that E guy, Scott. It takes you open to the work of the Spirit. From a few handfuls of first-generation CMs meeting in Springfield to a growing army, and how my heart is blessed to see it. We could only dream of these things, huh, Dave? They were wishes in our prayers. Sometimes I feel in a small way I've got to be like Simon in the temple. And being here, I hear the Lord say, you can rest now in peace, for I've seen the hand of God. Not the Messiah, we're still waiting. (laughs) Just in case any of you are confused about who you are. What are... The great works of the last decades, each of us, trophies of God's relentless pursuing hunting grace. So I would like you to stand for a moment with me and do the only sensible thing available to us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly Father, 
Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Why don't you sit again for a moment, or two, or four, or ten, or whatever. At Western, there is a generations old tradition. It started with Scott and Julie and a tambourine and a trumpet and a ukulele, I think. Peculiar. We have a square that is the crossroads of the Agora of Western, the marketplace of our campus. And we sing there. Sometimes it's a few, and sometimes it has been dozens. But it says this to me, and I would encourage for you to find the place in your life that would say the same thing. It says to me every time they sing or we sing, and it echoes off the arboretum of Seaholm Hill and wafts across to the professors. And I remember in Christmas time before our break, professors opening their windows to the cold to listen to the Jesus freaks sing Christmas hymns. Western underlying mission is to silence the voice of God every time we sing we make it a place that is not silent Every time we share with a student, we make it a place that is not silent. This is our blessing to fill the earth with the noisy happiness of the kingdom of God's good news. Again, Some of you, like Glenn, will not build cathedrals, but you might light a light in the heart of a man or a woman who could. When we first started, Dave Gable had a, and I don't know if I'm quoting him rightly, but I'm sure I'm saying it close. He was asked once, what do we require of Chi Alpha leaders? He says, well, you know, somebody willing, fully clothed. Well, you know, we were hippies, you know, and I think I would guess reasonably in their right minds. It always reminds me of Legion, the demoniac, after Jesus. Some of us may seem like we are not in our right minds. We may seem rather crazy to families or friends for taking the step onto the high wire with seemingly no safety net below us. But we are peculiar, aren't we? We can see the unseen. A person that could see the unseen was a young man who in 19, uh, I can't remember the exact, 76 probably, went to the Urbana Missions Conference. I went there once and it was incredible. And while there, this young man who was halfway through his MDiv up at Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia, had a momentary conversation with Dennis Gaylor, who was manning the table for Chi Alpha. Greg Smith's question was, does Chi Alpha have an internship? Dennis Gaylor says, well, yes, we do. 
It, in fact, it's right up by where you are in Bellingham. So he gave Greg our number. Greg called me and said, hi, you don't know me. I'm Greg Smith. But I have a passion. I want to take a year break in the midst of my MD. I have a passion to think about what it would be to be a college missionary. And I'm told you have an internship. Well, yeah, we had an internship like Scott Martin's written a book. It was in the dreamer stage. <laughs> and of all the human beings, can we go to that picture of, has it been up there already? With Glenn, or with Greg, there's Greg. It took a small question by an unknown person to get the dreamers to make the dream real. So every one of you who have ever been an intern anywhere in our growing communities of training, we're a little bit beyond of willing, clothed, and in your right mind. <laughs> to which Dave Gable would go, glory. <laughs> every benefit you've gained had its Genesis in God stirring that person. It matters that you let God stir you. It matters that you let God stir you. From that to that. And if the rumors and whispers of renewal are true, God prepare us all. that the fruit will be preserved. A few more thoughts. Enough about the past and its importance. What about the now? Well, what about the future? We know where the now is. It's right here and then meal. <laughs> what about the future? Well, I heard a couple mocking voices when I said I was mentored by Bob Dylan. But he was right. The times are a-changing. We live in our moment, in this such a time as this, and we sense the difference of it if you've lived very long. We sense the aggressiveness of the age. We sense the social shiftings, some hopeful, others dark. We see and interact and feel the swirling tumult of mental, emotional, social, educational, economic, political, and yes, religious confusion. The pressures are mounting. It reminds me what Jesus said about the ending age, which is everything from his resurrection forward. We're in it, brothers and sisters. He said it'd be like the birthing process of a woman in labor, sharper, closer, harder, and it feels like that, doesn't it? We see in the life of our students increasing distractions to more and more mindless entertainment. We see the growing implications and the impact of a whole generation now of students coming in who have been trained their entire life on the virtue of tolerance which is neither a virtue the way it's defined in our universities, nor tolerant. It leads to either apathy or anger. And neither are kingdom virtues. There is a kingdom tolerance, 
a welcoming, all-embracing of all peoples, because all are made in the image of God. I don't know how Glenn Suggs tolerated living with me. Come to think of it, after all these years of discipleship, I don't know how Shirley does that. (laughs) The challenges are legion. And they are direct threats, not to our mission, to the campus, because there are many ways to get on campus whether you're allowed to or not. There's always a free speech area. No, I think what's a greater danger that we face is the danger to being disciple makers. To, from the beginning of proclaiming the word and calling people into a repentant way of life, all the way toward maturity and being able to teach others, there is a stirring kind of perfect storm in my mind. There's the unprecedented growth of anxiety. Anxiety is all around our students, so self-aware of every place else that they've created the word safe space. This is problematic for us, isn't it? Because we are the best definition, or should be, of safe space, But what it's meant in the secular world is no thinking, no judgments, no clarity, no calling, but where I'm simply affirmed no matter what I think. Could you imagine if Glenn Suggs would have moved in with me and said, oh, I need to create a safe space? He would have never said, be with us hypocrites, and then we can all be together. He made a judgment on me, a true judgment, a judgment that convicted my hardened heart, a gracious, life-saving judgment. Can you imagine for our students how hard it will be to follow Jesus when they finally start reading the scripture and discover that he makes judgments? Oh, it starts with that obnoxiously gracious word, repent. Most gracious word in the Bible, because it says God is willing to welcome you home. Amazing grace, how sweet to sound. Our campus counseling centers are being overrun with these epidemics of anxiety, addiction, depression, loneliness, Identity crisis, crisis where what we feel determines more than what we actually are. Such deep divides within our world between students and others. It's where our liberal schools, and I live on the left coast amongst the progressives, and what do I see in growing numbers of our schools? Demonstrations of a hard, harsh, judgmental spirit even though they say they're safe. It's an impossible worldview to live. And so there is hope. Where sin does much abound, grace doth more abound. If you don't believe it, read the Jesus people's stories and then say, do it again. What can be done? Well, We can pray. Maybe we ought to start with that for once, huh? We could pray. In fact, I think we must pray. I think we must pray and know that others are praying with us. I think we must pray and know that every other Jesus person on campus from every other group is praying with us and us with them. We are not alone And the best news of all that Jesus says, wherever you go and make disciples, I will be with you to the ends of this present age. We can and we must pray for discerning wisdom. It's a time of increasing knowledge and deepening ignorance and confusion. 
We must pray that God will raise up within the communities of Jesus seers and prophets, seers for their wisdom and prophets for their foresight. A prayer that I learned very, very young from a pastor who prayed it over me every single Sunday night at altar call. He would come and lay his hands on my head and say, God, give him wisdom beyond his years. At first, I was offended. Hugh Canawan thinks I'm stupid. Now I'm thankful. Hugh Canawan was right. We must pray for more than what we are. We must not settle, I figured out my spiritual gift, and it's mercy. Oh, I think I need a rebuke. Oh, go see him. He gives severally as he wills. He gives individually at a moment and never again. He gives some people constantly. Throw away those gift tests. They'll kill your spiritual flexibility. And it will curb the kingdom of Jesus. We must discern about needed course corrections. Isn't it good to hear from Jason that they're completely rearranging things? They must have figured out they needed a course correction. At Western this last year, the team lead and the team got together for two days of review on this question. Of all the things we've done, they listed everything. I mean, everything the staff was getting their time finger in. And they were directed in a time of prayer and then to come together in time of prayer, tell us what things are critical to the missional need we see to be more present to students than we presently are. To be missionaries with more hours for reaching out and telling the story of Jesus or helping grow the story of Jesus. Tell me what's critical to that. Tell me what's good but not critical. And tell me what we shouldn't be doing anymore at all. It was like slaughtering sacred cows for me, but it has brought a regeneration and growing traction as we have reclaimed against this drift that we were in of not doing the one thing, but doing everything. There wasn't enough of us, and it wasn't core. We can do that. Finally, we can go to school with Paul, his little CMC ministry. I'd started in Acts 20 where he meets with the elders of Ephesus and he says this, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the community of Jesus which is obtained with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Therefore, be alert. Lesson number one, CMC, St. Paul. Healthy spiritual leadership is Paul's underlying concern. And healthy spiritual leadership is a theme we've begun to press and think about, but it must become a first concern in terms of our teams. Wise watching of our flocks is dependent on our own carefulness of watching our minds, our expectations, our motives, and our actions. So I encourage you to let Jesus probe you to gain awareness of your insecurities, 
Awarenesses of your jealousies, awareness of your proclivities, good or bad, your vulnerabilities. Now, here's the problem. I have some blind spots. And the problem is it doesn't matter how long I listen to Jesus, they stay blind, it seems. Ecclesiastes says two are better than one. If you don't have a Shirley in your life, then I would pray that you would invite someones into your life and give them the freedom to speak to blind spots and to encourage other things. For 25 years, I've had the unquestioned blessing of having Dave Nebel be a sounding board and a protecting brother in my life. And I have had teams that really do seek to speak the truth in love. (laughs) And I commend it to you. And then finally, I would encourage you to make 2 Timothy a repetitive book of spiritual leadership and learning. Paul will tell you what to flee from and flee toward. He'll make you aware what's chasing you and what you're chasing. He will help you know how you should live. He'll encourage you. He'll pray for you. And he will pour out his life for you. And so as we go forward, let us pray for ourselves. And let us pray that God will raise up people who will help us find our way. What we face our first brothers and sisters faced. Okay, they didn't face Facebook, and they didn't face the obnoxious cell phone, and they didn't face some of these things specifically, but they faced the powers, and they penetrated and overcame it. He did it for them. He'll do it again. In the darkness of various times throughout human history, where they pressed forward, God equipped them. He did it before, and he'll do it again. He will help us. He will lead us by his spirit. He will, in profound ways, help us to know how to invade and disrupt the powers of darkness. And so I'd like to close my remarks from dear, dear St. Paul. Such a good brother. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his coming kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out. Correct Rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desirings, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, but you... You keep your head in every situation. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And what you've heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit of the gospel that has been entrusted to you. Guard it with all your might and with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. My son, my daughter, 
Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable believers who will be also qualified and faithful to teach others. Go and to Timothy, to to it, to the world. Amen. I want you to uh, just stay seated for a moment. We are going to receive a meal here, okay? If you did not receive the cup and the bread when you came in, will you raise your hand? So, And let's not stand up yet. Just raise your hand, and server's going to come quickly to you. Praise team, will you come up? We're going to have one song. Hey, keep them up. Oh, my hand's up too. I didn't get one. (laughs) Oops. Why are we going to do this? You have heard wonderful things said in wonderful sessions. But now you go out. And in this simple, this is really simple, not very high church for my high church preferences, but it'll work. I think. (laughs) Look at this. Shirley, she's got the spirit of Shirley. She says, can I help you? (laughs) That's okay. He was broken for us. No, it's true. Oh, that wasn't meant to be humorous. I'm sorry. Everybody been served? Stand with me, will you? On the night that Jesus was betrayed in friendship with a kiss, he took bread and breaking it, he says, this is my body broken for you. Come. Eat the bread of life. Receive me within you. And giving thanks, they took the bread and they received it. Receive the sustenance of God's love in Christ. For greater love has no one than this that he would lay down his life. Let us eat together, brothers and sisters. And then he took the cup and giving thanks, which meant that most likely it was the third cup. The cup of thanksgiving Every time I take this, I say in my heart and mind what I say when I slip on my wedding ring. With my ring, it's I take thee, Shirley Mae Bovenkamp, to be my wife. And I recite as much as I can remember in my vows. I made a covenant of life with Shirley. Every time I take this, I say yes again to the God who made a covenant of life eternally with me. And so we give thanks to thee, O God, creator of the heavens and the earth. We give thanks for your steadfast loving kindness and mercies. We give thanks for this cup of life, for life is in the blood. And we receive it and say amen and amen. We are yours and to your glory we will live.